Hi guys, it's me, Mr. Bertosh, your incredibly handsome, horrific science teacher. And in this video, we are going to be talking about cycles, the cycles that occur all around the earth. What is a cycle? What does that word mean? We use it with different things, like uh, for example, a bicycle. Okay, we have the word cycle, and a bi we don't pronounce a bicycle, although from now on I'm going to bicycle. I like that way better. That sounds way cooler. Uh, but what is a cycle? Well, what does a bicycle do? It's what are the wheels doing? They are spinning, they're rotating, right? And the chain is going around in a circle. Okay. Well, that is what a cycle is. It's like we, we say the cycle of the seasons. Because every year, those four seasons, if you live in a temperate zone, are cycling. They're going over and over and over again, repeating and repeating. When I'm recording this, it's almost about to be autumn, which is my favorite season, by the way. Uh, so those are, that's what a cycle is. Okay. And on the earth, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of, uh, cycles that occur. Uh, that is a quote from Parent Trap. A lot, a lot, a lot. Anyway, uh, there is a, there's a lot of cycles that occur on a predictable and regular basis. And we are not going to talk about all of them in this video. I talk about some of them in other videos too, but in this video, we're going to talk about three cycles, and that is the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. And the reason that we're talking about cycles is primarily so that you understand that there are ongoing cycles. So your goal is to understand that the earth is a living planet uh, geologically. There are ongoing processes that occur in a predictable way. And the reason we're talking about these three specific cycles, the water cycle, the carbon cycle, and the nitrogen cycle, is because they're a good introduction to cycles. And in their own right, they're important to understand. So let's talk about, before we talk about cycles, let's talk about a couple of important terms that you are going to use with all cycles. Okay, the first term is the word reservoir. And you probably heard that word before, reservoir, because we use it as humans often when we're referring to lakes. Uh, we call a lake, a man-made lake a reservoir. Uh, also, we use that word in engines, like a oil reservoir or a reservoir of uh, windshield wiper fluid or whatever, brake fluid, whatever. Okay, a reservoir is a place where stuff is stored. That's really all it means. Okay, so if I'm talking about a reservoir of water in science, I am not just referring to man-made lakes, I'm referring to all lakes and really anywhere. The ocean is a reservoir of water. Anywhere where water is stored. If I'm talking about a reservoir of carbon, then I'm talking about anywhere or carbon is stored, or likewise, a reservoir of nitrogen would be anywhere where nitrogen is stored. Hooray! And then the other word you need to know is the word flux. Okay, and I am not talking about the flux capacitor on Back to the Future. I am talking about movement. The word flux refers to when something is in flux, that means it's moving. It's moving about when it's in flux. So when a material such as water or carbon or nitrogen or anything else is moving from one reservoir to another reservoir, we say it is in flux. A flux is movement. 
So different fluxes, for example, in the water cycle would be rain because it's water is moving from the clouds, which is a reservoir, to the ground. Groundwater is a reservoir or wherever it's ultimately ending up. Or evaporation would be another example of a flux in the water cycle. When it's uh, moving from a water body and it's evaporating up to the clouds to another uh, reservoir. Okay. So those are important terms to know, reservoir and flux. Now let's talk about these three cycles, starting with the water cycle. And I'm going to go through the water cycle in more detail. I'm going to go through the carbon cycle in slightly less detail and the nitrogen cycle in even less detail. And I'll explain, I'll explain a rate why I am doing that uh, when we get to them the other ones. So the water cycle first, okay, the, the water cycle is the cycling of water, the movement of water from one place to another, the fluxurating, that's not a real word, the fluxification, not really a word either. But anyway, uh, the movement of water from one place to a, another, from one reservoir to another. Well, I can't really start, I can't say let's pick a starting place because it's a cycle. I can jump in anywhere. So let's jump into the biggest reservoir of all. And that's a good, as good of a starting place as any. What do you suppose is the largest reservoir of water on the earth? Where is most of the water found? In the, there's this massive body of water. It is called an ocean. And it is a global ocean. There are five oceans, but they're all connected and they form one global ocean. And uh, that is the biggest reservoir of water by far on the earth. Okay, so most of the water on the earth that is currently on the earth uh, is in the oceans. But it's not the only reservoir because some well water is often evaporating from the ocean and when it evaporates from the ocean where does it go where does it evaporate what is evaporation evaporation is a type of flux a type of movement from the ocean or wherever a lake or wherever it's evaporating from a puddle on your driveway up to the atmosphere right and so it uh, evaporates, in this case, from the ocean, and it goes up as a gas. It turns from a liquid to a gas, and it floats up into the atmosphere and floats away and forms clouds, and the clouds move. And where do they go? Well, they go all over the earth in the atmosphere. They float about, and then eventually, when the conditions are right, what happens? A cloud eventually uh, is disturbed in some way by a weather pattern or a front or something, uh, the temperature drops, something causes it to, or the temperature increases, something causes it to eventually become disrupted and it forms droplets and the droplets fall as precipitation. That might be rain, it might be snow, it might be hell or sleet or whatever, but eventually it falls as precipitation to the earth. So another flux. Okay. And then it goes all over the place, right? It might sink into the ground and become groundwater, which is a type of reservoir. It might go into streams and then rivers and then bigger rivers and ultimately back into the ocean or into a lake. Okay. The water goes all over the place. It might become frozen in ice caps. And sometimes water will get trapped in one place for a very long time. For example, if it gets ends up on the ice caps, it might become frozen there potentially for hundreds of thousands of years or more. Uh, and it's stuck for a while, but it's not there forever because eventually it's going to escape. It's going to be like, wee, I'm free. And it's going to evaporate again and or go back into the ocean or whatever and start the whole process over again. So that is the water cycle, the movement of water around the earth, an ongoing process. The, res the major reservoirs are the ocean. What else? Lakes, groundwater, ice, uh, rivers. You, you are a reservoir of water because you are uh, you know, a good portion of your 
Like two thirds of your body is made out of water. So the biosphere, animals and plants are full, uh, full of water. Okay. So those are the reservoirs. And the fluxes are evaporation and uh, precipitation and anytime water is moving from one place to another. All right. Now let's talk about the carbon cycle. Water is not the only thing moving around from place to place in a predictable way. So too is carbon. And incidentally, you are also made of carbon and a lot of carbon. And so are all living things made of a lot of carbon. So one of the major reservoirs in the carbon cycle are living things. And let's start there. Let's jump into the carbon cycle with living things because living things have a lot of carbon. And when the living things die, uh, what happens? Well, everybody goes to their funeral and cries a lot and um, probably not. The dinosaurs probably didn't have funerals, but, uh, but you never know. But the dinosaurs died and all the trees and plants died back when the dinosaurs were alive. And all of those things fell to the ground. And a lot of them were tra became trapped in the ground and formed oil and coal and natural gas and uh, other things of that nature. And that carbon... That carbon, those carbon reservoirs, and there are vast carbon reservoirs under the ground, made up of the material of formerly living things, oil and uh, coal and natural gas. All of those things are carbon reservoirs made from the decomposing bodies of plants and animals from a long time ago. Well, we use them as fuel because they make a really great fuel. They have a lot of energy stored in them. And you can burn them, and they produce an awesome amount of energy. And so we burn these carbon fuels, and what happens? We release the carbon, uh, and that's not incidentally uh, the only way that it's released. There are other ways that natural gas and things end up back in the atmosphere, natural processes. Okay? Uh, and so the carbon escapes from these reservoirs. And it ends up in the atmosphere. And then what happens? Well, living things need carbon. And so we might take carbon, for example, carbon dioxide. Do you hear the word carbon in that? Carbon dioxide. Uh, and we use them, or plants in particular, use carbon dioxide. And so carbon is moving around the... Uh, you know, the earth, the atmosphere, the various reservoirs of carbon. Now, this cycle has been in balance for a long time. But lately, the last 100 years or so, humans have been releasing a lot of carbon in a much more, uh, more quickly, more quickly rated, uh, which is a great word, uh, pace than is natural. And that is causing more and more carbon to collect in the atmosphere than has been in the atmosphere in the past and has potential impacts. And we're still learning about those impacts. We're still trying to understand how our release of humans releasing all this carbon into the environment uh, is offsetting or unbalancing the carbon cycle and what the impact of that will be. So... Uh, that's the carbon cycle. And then uh, last of all is the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle is an important cycle if you keep fish tanks, uh, which I do. Uh, it's, uh, it's the movement of nitrogen through the atmosphere, or through rather not just the atmosphere, but the earth uh, as well. And uh, the nitrogen cycle involves the decaying of living things, really, and the waste products of living things. And the reason, the only reason I wanted to talk about the nitrogen cycle is because it, I wanted you to be aware that this, this, the nitrogen cycle largely has to do around living things. And I just wanted you to see that some of these cycles are... Uh, helpful to living things and caused by and influenced heavily by living things and others like the carbon cycle are uh, human, living things in particular right now 
humans are uh, perhaps disrupting the the cycle. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the nitrogen nitrogen cycle right now because it's got there's a lot to it. Uh, but just know that it is the nitrogen cycle occurs as nitrogen changes form several times. It forms nitrites and nitrates. Uh, or starts as ammonia, nitrite, and eventually is releases nitrogen back into the atmosphere as living things or dead things, dying things, decay. Uh, other cycles, which we're not going to talk about in this video, but we'll talk about in other videos, are the rock cycle, uh, phosphorus. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of cycles going on in our environment that occur in a very predictable way. Hi guys, thanks for watching my video. These rambling science videos where I go unscripted and just kind of barf up all the science knowledge out of my head are part of a series that go along with an online class that I teach, which you can sign up for if you go to handsomescienceteacher.com. I also have a whole bunch of free resources for homeschoolers. I have uh, hundreds of articles on every topic that uh, covers your entire science curriculum from fifth through eighth grade. I have online games and quizzes, all curated and written by uh, this handsome guy, uh, a science teacher with, well, three, three degrees, but two of them are in science. So it's uh, targeted right to and directly to your uh, your science student so sign up subscribe to the channel and I release lots of videos also in addition to these ones lots of little uh, short videos that are like two minutes long that cover science topics those ones you don't get to see my handsome face but they're still good videos and they're much more targeted and those ones are scripted so you don't have to hear me like you are right now going blah 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 the end uh, subscribe thank you goodbye